All right, I get started. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, Steve Nysullivan. I'm the VP of Engineering at Silicon Valley Data Science. Uh, my talk is going to be about the different data formats that we have and we can use in HDFS and kind of walk you through somewhat of a journey on how we do that. I can first roll. This is us. We're a small uh, boutique data science and data engineering uh, company. We're based out of Mountain View, but we have people all around the US. Um, this is our philosophy then when we do our consulting. Um, the first thing we want to do is identify the business need and actually go for that and actually iterate through using an agile process. And obviously, we want to always collaborate with our customers when we work, we work through that process. This is our philosophy. All right, the agenda today. I'm going to have a quick, very quick introduction. Then I'm going to talk about data formats. How do we choose these data formats? Schema evolution. Um, I will summarize it, and we will have questions afterwards. I've got a few of my team with me today that can, if I can't answer the question, they definitely can answer the question. So introduction. So we've all gone, we've bought this nice Hadoop cluster from one of our favorite vendors. We've installed it either in the cloud or in our data center. And then the next thing we're going to be asked is, let's load some data. Then we have a thought, well, what do I load it with? OK, we figure out what data we want to load. OK, what format do I load this data with? What is it going to look like? And this is what we're going to talk about today, and the different data formats and the pros and cons of using one over another. And in some cases, you may use more than one. And in most cases, we do. So data formats. Right, so we're going to talk about storage formats and what they do and some of the pros and cons of why we would want to use them. So I'm going to talk about five of them. So we're going to talk about text, sequence files, Avro, Parquet, and optimized row columnar format, or ORC is what I'm going to call it, because I can't say optimized row columnar that quickly too many times, because I will get it wrong. So OCI is what I'm going to call it. Let's take text. Text is what we've all used. right? It's basically the CSV files, our JSON files, XML if you have XML. It's readable. We can read it, we pull it up, put it into, a, you know, into your favorite editor, you can read that format. It's somewhat delimited, so other systems can use it. We've been doing this for years, loading data in. I can remember doing it a while, long, long time ago using SQL Loader. It kind of ages me with Oracle there, but that's what I was doing. <laughs> so as I said, it's human readable, so it's nice and easy. But it's bulky. Yes, we can compress it, but once I compress it, I can't split it up. I can't split it across multiple things. So that compressed format has to be used together. The next one I'm going to talk about that came obviously very early with HDFS was this idea of sequence files. So it's a binary format, key value pair. It's, it is row based. And it's, columny, it's used a lot when we do our MapReduce jobs. I'm going from one job to another. We use sequence files a lot. Great format. And it obviously gets compressed, and it's splittable. Right? So when it's even compressed, we can split that file up. So it works really well with MapReduce. Then we have Avro. Right? This is the serialization one. It's schema on read. We tell the schema as part of the file. Great format. Obviously not necessarily human readable, but the schema is in the file. So there's always a case, and I've done this before, lots, load lots of text files in my, into my Hadoop cluster. But unfortunately, it's like, OK, what's the schema, and why did I do that? And then I may have some changes, and OK, the schema is somewhat different. With Avro, is that schema is in that file. And it also supports schema evolution, which I will get to um, later in the talk. Parquet. Parquet is a really good format, uh, for definitely for reading, right? It's columnar oriented binary format, right? It's based on the Dremel paper, which is nice. It's obviously compressed. It's very efficient in I.O., particularly when you're selecting only a few columns. I'm going to show some examples of that later on, of what we use and why we use this. And we use it actually with a client. And I can kind of talk around what we did and how we did it and actually show you some metrics behind it. The other one is ORC. 
right? This is uh, basically the evolution of the RC file, right? Very similar to Parquet in, in, in the sense it's, co it's, it's columnar. It's very lightweight. In actual fact, it compresses really well. And again, you see some of this information later on. And it actually has statistics um, built into the format. So I can do the simple sum counts, max and min, et cetera. So how do we choose them? So I'm going to talk about, first of all, I'm going to talk for write. Then I'm going to talk about read. And this is where, in, in write, we may choose one format. In read, we want another format. And then we've got to figure out what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. Right, let's talk about the functional requirements. What type of data do you have? Right, choosing a data format, you've got to figure out, is it compatible with your processing tools or query tools? If I choose a data format that isn't compatible, uh, an example would be if I choose ORC and I'm in CDH and I want to use Impala, I can't use that file. They haven't supported it yet. Um, in earlier versions of Spark, it was the same. If I created an ORC file, I couldn't use it in Spark. Newer versions of Spark, that is supported. Then it's the question of what's your file size? How are you going to spread that load? Do you have space? What, which one compresses better than, that are better than another one? Maybe another option to think about. And does your scheme evolve over time? I remember my days as a data engineer, getting way back with Oracle when I was doing this, and we had a schema change. And it was this like nightmare event, like, oh my, I've got to add some columns, or I've got to rename some columns, and it's an effort to go do that. I can remember when working on MySQL, working with ISIM files, and having the same thing, and thinking, I'm just going to change the metadata, and it should be really quick. And it never is, because it has to rewrite the whole file. And when you have a really big file, that's really difficult to do while you're online. But it happens. We know it happens. And I'm going to talk about an example that we did that with with a particular client as well. Speed concerns. So as I said, or have said, or thought about, so Parquet and uh, ORC are columnar formats. Actually writing a columnar format file is slower than writing an Avro file, or a text file, or a sequence file. So if speed of write is important to you, but not query, well, you may not want to use Parquet or ORC. As I said, Avro file is a data serialization format. Um, there is a lot of cases where we would want to use that, and that becomes really nice. And rather than just putting in plain text, it has, as I said, it has the schema in the file. Very, very useful for, for wanting to go read that after the fact of what happened. And it also has schema evolution, which again, as I said, I'll talk more about that later. But it's also very important. As I said, text is bulky and inefficient, but very easy to read. So if I want to go pull up that file, I can read that information. Very easy. You know, it was the one that I always, I just loved it. I could see it, and I could read it, and I can then point Hive or Impala at it, and it all worked. But it is, it is inefficient. All right, this is some interesting graphs I'm going to kind of talk about and, and think about what we're doing. This is when we're running, we're running some information. So we, I have two tables. Um, I have a narrow data set. So think of this as my access log file. And I have a very, very wide data set. This, has, this example had a 1,000 columns wide in it. So even on the narrow data set, text and sequence files, very quick to go in and to go right at. Very easy. This is obviously running on HDP. Very easy, very quick. Then we look at Avro and Parquet. Avro is a little bit less than what Parquet was, but ORC took longer. And that was on the narrow data set. And look at the timings as well. And um, by the way, the narrow data set had 10 million, row, 10 million rows in it. The wide data set only had 4 million rows in it. So we look at the wide data set, text and sequence files, they were the fastest ones to write to. And that's what, is what I would expect. 
And then obviously Avro is a little bit behind that because it's, it's doing some obviously serialization and has the schema in it. And then we look at Parquet and ORC. Because of Columnar, it takes longer to, to go load. So to be nice and play fair with everybody else, we also did it in CDH. Um, same data, same file. Some interesting things you note there. It does exactly the same thing when you look at it from the sizing, right? Text and sequence file were faster. Avro, Parquet, and then ORC. The interesting one that we did is, okay, let's just do it as, as a Spark job. I'm going to read in that file, and I'm going to write it into, in three different formats. And again, I didn't use ORC in this format because I didn't have the latest version of Spark installed. So obviously, text and Avro took nearly the same amount of time. When we look at Parquet, it took a lot longer. So it's back to that. It's, if I need something to get to the disk as soon as possible into this distributed file system, and I'm not worried about querying it afterwards, which we'll, we'll get into, Avro seems a really good format for that, or text seems a really good format for that. The interesting one is now file size. As I said before, ORC actually has some really good compression. So if space is an issue and you need compression, ORC, they do a fantastic job of compression. Um, Parquet does as well. Um, most of the compression here, by the way, is all on Snappy. Apart from Avro, we use Deflate. Um, I kind of get into that when we get to reading. Um, it was very interesting, some of the experiences that I saw a client, and then when I did it internally, I saw something a little different. Um, but actually, Snappy and Avro actually has the same kind of compression uh, when we look at sizing standpoint. It was very similar. But as you can see, when I look at sequence files and text files, it didn't compress as well as the other, other ones. The benefits of things like Avro and Parquet, because of Columnar, it actually puts things together that actually compresses a lot better than it was just basically simple text that you're pushing in. OK, some use cases. Let's take Avro for an, exa an example. And we had this again at a client that we work with. Um, what they had is they had lots of events coming in, which is great. Let's take this event stream. We're pushing it through. Um, things like Kafka and Spark streaming. But what they had as part of their example was, oh, by the way, these events can change. And we need, to, we need to be able to query them as soon as they come in, but the schema changes. Well, basically, the schema evolves. And it can evolve like, from in, like, in a 10-minute scenario, or it may take days for the schema to evolve, but it will evolve. It's going to happen. So we looked at different ways of actually, how do we go and fix that? What do we use as a format? So we did some examples. We, we, like, when we work on these things, we don't just use one. We actually did it with a few others. And what we found in this example was, because of the speed and what they wanted to do at the end of it from a query standpoint was, if I can get it in fast enough with that schema evolution, Avro seems like the best use case for this. Great use case. Unfortunately, they had a very, very wide row. They had a very, very wide row, so they had lots and lots of columns. Um, if I remember rightly, it was, in the, in, it, was in the, it was in the range of anywhere between 700 and 1,000 columns, and it could go up. So in this case, I'm going to use this as an Avro example. Was yeah, this could be a great use case for Avro. Unfortunately, when we want to query that data, and they weren't querying every single column all the time, they were only querying a very small subset of that data all the time, we ended up using Parquet for that because we looked at the business use case. So from a technology standpoint, Avro was, was probably the, hey, from a, re, from a write standpoint, Avro is perfect for this. But when we look at the use case from the, what the business wanted and, at, and they wanted really fast queries, Actually, Parquet was a really good use case. It just took a lot, you know, a lot longer to, to write it. Not in the case of a lot longer. It just took longer to write it than what Avro would have done. And we, would, and we had to actually do the schema evolution somewhat by hand. 
as well. And I can get into that a little bit later when we talk about schema evolution. So the other one is sequence files. Um, pretty much when we do our MapReduce job, that's pretty much what we use. That's, that's a great use case of sequence files. We won't want to drill too much into that, but it, was, it seems like the, the, the normal, the standard way of doing things. It's nice and quick. I'm using it between jobs. I'm not using it after the fact. Now, when that MapReduce job finishes, I may write that out as a different format. So maybe working through the job, doing some stuff in between these jobs, but at the end result, I may end up having either Avro or Parquet or ORC. A lot of it depends on what that use case is at the end. And obviously tags, again, my favorite. Um, it's always a fail safe in some cases, is I need to get a lot of data into my HDFS cluster as quickly as possible for whatever reason, and I don't want to spend a lot of time doing it. When I look at Avro, when I look at Parquet, I have to do work, obviously, right? I've got to figure out what the schema is. If I just want that text file in, that's a great example of just pushing it and throwing it at your Hadoop cluster. And a lot of the times we do that, we may do that through a pipe like Kafka, for instance. So one of the, uh, one of the guys who invented Kafka, uh, Jay Kreps, actually has come up with a, he has a company now called Confluent. And they actually have a schema registry. So the idea there is they can register that schema, which can do all the schema evolution for you, and will take that text or whatever the events are coming through and actually serialize it using, Av they use Avro a lot, throwing it through the Kafka pipe, then pushing it back down to HDFS. The good thing is there, they actually do a schema registry as well. So you know exactly what you're doing. So in some cases, I'm taking that text format, I'm pushing it through the system, and there's very little work I need to do quote unquote. There's always work, nothing's there for free, but it's a, a nice way of doing it, especially if I'm doing events or have large pieces of data. Now, obviously, if I have a large data set, the easiest way to do is just do a copy. Copy that, t that, that data in, put it onto desk. If I need to convert it to a different format, if it's in there and I've got some sort of schema, you know, I've got some idea what that schema looks like with delimiters, let me throw up an external hive table and do a copy as select and just copy it as another table, right? That's the quickest and easiest way to do it in some cases. Ah, something like that. Types of queries, right? So if, I'm gonna, if I have like a, an access log that has 10 columns, in this case, this is my narrow one. I may not want to go and do Parquet or ORC because the benefits are I'm going to probably read, possibly read every single column or more than it makes sense to do, go do. And we see this in a read, some read graphs. At a certain point, you don't get any benefits from Avro, from, sorry, Avro, from Parquet or ORC. So again, we need to figure out what that use case is. What does it look like? What would we be doing? Compression's the other one. Which one compresses the best? As we talked about, ORC has the best compression. You know, the, the, the guys that actually developed that did a really good job on compression. And obviously, when we compress and we've got CPU cycles, it does increase speed because we can read stuff off the disk faster. And if the compression is done on CPU, and CPUs are pretty good now than they were back in the day. I was, I was young, I suppose. It's, it's, it works out really well. And as I said before, Parquet and ORC sacrifice write for read. And let's see that. As I said, this is, this is the setup that we use for the read. Uh, narrow data set, 10 million rows, 10 columns. So think of this as an access log file, which is what our basis was. This is the wide data set file, 4 million rows, 1,000 columns. And this actually came from one of our clients we were doing some work with. And in actual fact, it was just over 1,000 columns. And I said before, compression, snappy for everything apart from Avro, which I use deflate for. And I show a graph at the end of why I chose deflate, and it was very interesting when I saw the results. And again, these aren't benchmarks. These were just running on our AWS cluster, on our HTTP one, and our Cloudera one. Right, so this is a narrow data set. I'm using, I'm using Hive to read it. Um, the interesting thing here is I have normally a query one. The query one is a select count. When I did it on HTTP using Stinger, 
select count came back in milliseconds because the information stored, because it was an internal table, not an external table, it was stored, it came back immediately. Reminds me of the days of MySQL when I would do that on MySQL over Oracle and I have a, like a 10 million row table and then the MySQL one came back saying, I'm like, what's going on here? And then you realize, oh, you're using a MyISM table and it can pick up the metadata. The same idea. The interesting thing here is when I query for five columns and then go to 10, well, five columns, five conditions and go to 10 conditions, in actual fact, the, um, the ORC one, I'm looking at the colors here, the sequence one and the text one all dropped in speed. It was faster when I did more, which wasn't what, isn't what I was expecting for ORC. But when we look at Parquet, was basically level, and Avro actually took longer, right? So this is one of the things I'm showing this as an example for is, don't just pick one and go with it. Actually pick a few and experiment with it. Figure out what the best one is. So this is also, this is the wide data set. A little different results. Again, not exactly what I was expecting. So we did five columns and the ORC one and the Parquet one was all the same at the bottom, which is what I kind of expected. The sequence file and the text file there, it is text, yes, is what I expected too. It stays the same, it's level. The Avro one isn't what I expected. Um, it would be good, I never got around to it, it's actually taken, I used the word I never got around to it. One of the members of my staff, um, I didn't actually ask her to do it, but she did a lot of work getting this all together, so kudos to her. The deflate one isn't what I was expecting. So one of the things is actually to go rerun that at Snappy, what would Snappy look like? So the narrow data set, and again, this is the interesting one. On the narrow data set, using, this is Hive on CDH, was actually probably better to use sequence files and text files because I got the, the results were always somewhat the same and it didn't go up and they went over when I looked at um, ORC and Parquet. And again, Avro is this weird out there and that, was, that would want to tell me, I need to go recheck that. Let's try some different experiments on that one. So this is now the wide data set on CDH and Hive, which has the same, what I expected. The Parquet and the ORC one at the bottom, because I have a thousand columns, I'm only selecting a subset of the columns. The interesting one here is the difference between the sequence files and the text file. I was expecting those to be somewhat the same, but in actual fact, the sequence file did a better job than the text file here. And the other outlier is my Avro file. Again, I need to go figure out why that was happening. And that's why I left it in here, was to show the fact that in some cases, we may get to like, that doesn't look right. That's not what I expected in this experiment, in this test I was doing. Let's go rerun it, let's, go, let's see what was going on. And by the way, this was our AWS cluster. Other things were running on this as well. We tried to limit it down. Could also be caching at some level as well. Again, not benchmarking. These are just initial ideas of what's going on in the system. All right, this is the narrow data set using CDH. This is very interesting. Not, again, not what I was really expecting. Like that text file was slow when I did a select condition zero, but then kind of sped up when I did the conditions with five and, and 10 in this case. And Avro was still weird. Um, and Parquet was great when there was no conditions. And so was, um, the sequence files, and I was expecting, yeah, that's right, there's no ORC because I'm using Impala. So Cloudera up there, if you can support ORC, that'd be great. Um, the wide data set, this is exactly what I was expecting, apart from the Avro one. And this is the performance we can get when we look at like choosing the right data format. Again, this is a wide table, it's a thousand columns wide, and I'm filtering either by no conditions or five conditions or 10 or or 20, and as you can see, it kind of gradually goes up in speed. What I was actually expecting was the text one and the sequence one to kind of stay the same. What that tells me there is potentially on those two files, there was some caching going on, would be my, would be my, my thoughts. 
Looks like there's some caching going on at that point. Right, so this is actually a graph that we did actually for a client um, a while back. Um, and the idea, the, the experiment was what we did for a client. The data wasn't theirs. The idea, the, the data was there. Again, I don't have ORC in here because I was doing a lot of it in part. And what I show in here is with compression, without compression, Avro had two different compressions. I had snappy and deflate. And if you see in this example, this is one I chose, hey, yes, go to use deflate. Well, deflate was, was better than snappy. In actual fact, snappy and text snappy for Avro were exactly the same. And the sequence files were, were taking longer. But the main one there is the parquet one. And as you can see, it was going up. Every time I added more filters on the columns, it was going up, which is what I would expect. It's a column of format, it's a column of format data format. That's all I would expect if I'm choosing more and more columns. All right, use cases. Um, as I said before, if the data set changes over time and I want to query old data set with new data set, Avro is a really good example of that. What I can do though, um, and that, so the, sorry, the schema evolution on that is I'm actually probably renaming columns as well, right? I may have misspelled them. I may have used color one way in the UK and color a different way in the US, and I had to put them together because someone told me I'm spelling it wrong. Normally, my nine-year-old daughter is telling me I'm spelling things wrong, Dad. Why is there a U in color? There isn't a U in color. Anyway, sorry. Joke there, but my daughter does that all the time to me when I spell things wrong. Um, so that might be a case of using Avro for that. Now, if I'm just basically adding columns, I can actually do that with Parquet. But you've got to be really, really careful when you do it with Parquet, and it'll have the same effect. I can add, new, I can add columns to the end of that file. Make sure your consistency when you're doing that when you have a big job. So there's more, probably more work to do than you were doing it with Avro, but I can actually do that. And we were doing that with that particular client I talked about earlier on when we had lots of events and we wanted to use Avro, but it didn't make sense from a query standpoint. We just added columns at the end, but we did it in, in such a way that there was only one thing that would add columns, not two, because if you add them in the wrong order, it won't tell you there's a column mismatch well, depending on your query engine, it may tell you there's a column mismatch. What'll happen is I show you the wrong data for the wrong column, which in actual fact is probably worse than telling you there's a column mismatch. So the Avro one, uh, as the example there was, I had a data set, the columns changed, the schema changed, names got changed around, but I had data that was old, that was in, in a certain way, then I had new data and it was evolving. But I always wanna go back and query the whole data set. In my days of doing Oracle or MySQL, I may have basically joined those tables together and do that query and it'd be a view and they wouldn't see what was going on behind it. Well, in our days of HDFS, I could do the same thing. I could create, create a view that looks at these tables and joins them together, or I could do something like Avro, which does that for me within the schema. And I will show an example of that and walking through that schema evolution. Parquet, query a few, a few columns on a white table. This was a client that we had. Um, they had a, as I said, they had a data set which was millions, I think it was 100 million rows, if not long more, and it was growing all the time. And they basically had demographic, geographic information about things and potentially for people to buy stuff. And they had different categories of how that worked. But they didn't query the whole data, the, the whole data set, they only queried pieces of it to get out some information. And in this case, they were using Oracle to do that querying, and of course, they were saying, well, you only can query these columns because these are the ones that we can index. Obviously, that's how we would do it. In this case, well, let's do this in a different way. Let's use HDFS. This, we were using CDH. Um, the reason for CDH was actually to use Impala. And we wanted to query the data set in a way that it was very, very fast. And I can remember the first time we showed them this example. And by the way, when we, when we walked through this, with the client, we actually showed them every single different ways that we could potentially go do it and different engines that we can go use. And when we showed them the Impala one, we sat there in the room with their other engineers and their business people, and we ran a query. Really big data set, we was only querying probably about 10 different columns with some filters on them. 
And all of a sudden, the query comes back up, and it you know, took seconds. And everyone was like, wow. And then obviously, that, the one person in the room, normally used to be me when I was on the other side of that, would say, you cached that query. Obviously, right? Cache that query. So we said, OK, well, give us a query. Give us some columns. Pull anything from this 1,000 rows. It's like magicians at Vegas or something. And we did. And all of a sudden, it came back just as quick. And it was like the room went silent. And one of the, one of the business people were basically turned to the CTO and said, so when can we have this? Because it was, it, was, it was that fast for them. Otherwise, it would take them a long time, but, and, they, and they couldn't query anything in a data set. It's always important to figure out what do they want at the end of it? What is the business goal? Why do I want to do this? I'm not going to use technology for technology's sake. What can we use? And there's other things. As I said before, there was one where we wouldn't use Avro, but Parquet was a better fit. OK, let's talk about schema evolution. So I'm going to talk about what is schema evolution, data formats that can evolve, Examples and use cases. Right, schema evolution. I want to add columns. I want to rename columns. I want to remove columns. And why do we need this? Anyone who's worked a long time with any kind of database, we do this all the time. New functionality comes in the business. I need to add rows. We don't really need those columns anymore, or add rows, add columns. We don't need these columns anymore. I can delete them. Or the usual one is renaming a column is probably because Stephen spelt it wrong because he didn't spell it the right way. Go rename the column. Or in the case when we were in the UK is, you know, we don't have zip codes, we have postal codes, so I'm going to rename that column to postal codes and not zip codes. Just the way it was, the way we did it. And that's why we need to be able to do this sometimes. Because I still want to query the same piece of data. I want to pull out the data that I've already got there. I don't want to create another data set because it's in a different schema and then figure out how I join those two together. Right, data formats that I can evolve. As I said, Arrow can definitely do this. And the example I will show is with Avro. Parquet, we can do it. We can add columns at the end. As far as I'm aware of, ORC, you can't do that with. It wouldn't surprise me if they have a way of doing that very soon. It's very powerful. And hopefully, they may come into renaming it and potentially deleting them. So here's the example. I'm a big Doctor Who fan. So this is an Avro example. Um, what I have here is original data set actually came from the Telegraph in the UK. Um, it's a great little data set to go play with if you're a Doctor Who fan. And this is my Avro schema. I don't normally try and show code and stuff on the, on, on the screen because it's kind of hard to see sometimes. But that's my Avro schema. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go query this data. So I'm going to go for the original Doctor Who. I was back in the day. John Pertwee was my favorite Doctor Who. If anyone who follows Doctor Who, John Pertwee, you can probably guess my age from that. Um, and this is my data set. And this is what we have. I have like Doctor, Actor, Episode Number, Title. Anyway, obviously, they created a new Doctor Who came along that everyone probably knows more than the old original Doctor Who. So we're going to make some changes. Well, instead of saying Doctor Who season, I'm going to or Doctor Who season, I'm going to say Doctor underscore Who season. Well, I'm going to say Doctor Who season is what I'm going to call it. But originally, if I can go back, it was called Doctor Who season. So I'm actually renaming it. And they call it, they call it, in Avro, they're called I'm aliasing it. I'm doing the same with Doctor Actor. Instead of saying Doctor Actor, I'm going to say Doctor Who Actor. The other one I'm doing is this estimated. I'm going to get rid of that. I don't need that column anymore. I'm going to get rid of it. And by the way, because it's the new Doctor Who, the old Doctor Who, we didn't have HD. The new Doctor Who, we have HD. That's, have a, uh, it's called a high definition HD. And by the way, if I don't see it, the default is no. It's not in HD. So what I've done now is another data set, which is the new Doctor Who, with the old Doctor Who, running the same query, looking at two different Avro files, one with one schema, one with a new schema. And I'm loading them together. So you can tell me my favorite new Doctor Who is, is Tenant. My favorite old Doctor Who is Pertwee. And the other, the estimate isn't there. The column names has changed. And right at the end, if you can see, is HD. We've got yes and no. And all the John Pertwee ones, we should say no, because it's a default value. So it's very powerful to add and change that schema. 
So when a user comes up to me, hey, I need this column, but I need it with the old data set as well, this is a way of, is, is a way of doing it. And by the way, it's not a very, very wide table, so it may work out really well for Avro. Again, let's experiment with these things. As I said before in the use cases, new things added to the stream. If I get new columns, new, new data, I, wanna, I want to be able to evolve that schema. I want to see historic data that I have with the new data that I have. The example of the Doctor Who, Doctor Who original, Doctor Who new. Well, the one I like is the business has changed the field name column, the field column name. And that used to happen to me a lot, and I used to get mad at it as a data engineer. You went, what? You've changed the field, why? And I have to go change it. In the old days, we wouldn't actually change it. We would create a view around it and change the view. Because it was quicker, and you knew they were going to change their mind five minutes after seeing it, right? It happens all the time. And they're the reasons for schema evolution in this case. Right, to summarize, when we have different data formats and we have the ability to use them, we've got to understand what the business is. What, what do they need? Where do I want to have that schema? The other one to say is, I would say, is experiment with them. You can see the benefits of one over another. They're very, very powerful to go use. And with that, I'm going to say questions. Yes? And that's exactly what we do. So the question was, is why don't I use Avro as the um, writing to, then have another set, another data set off of the Avro data set that's, say, in Parquet, for instance? In some cases, that's exactly what I do. What happens is that if they, the, the, then the question becomes, if there's a schema evolution that involves renaming a column, that can kind of get harder with Parquet, unless I rebuild the whole Parquet data set, or ORC data set is the same thing. But in some cases, that's exactly what we do. Yes? These performance numbers uh, that you have shown, they're very interesting. Yes, again, they're not benchmarks. Yeah. They were just us running on a, I think it was a four node cluster, a four node cluster of CDH. I think it's a three node cluster on HTTP in our own little AWS development environment. So they're just ideas and just to point things like, why is that funding faster than that one and what can we do? The data structure itself wasn't nested. It was still, it was still very, it was very flat. We didn't have any nested data structures. I wanted to see if you have the number for the nested. We, do, I, I don't. Um, that is actually a good one to do, and um, I will actually take that back and use it for a blog post that we want to write with that. The only problem with the nested ones, I can't use Impala for it, so it has to be all in Hive. Yes. So to answer that question, I haven't done that experiment over those things. A lot of times we, we've been using Parquet a lot because of um, Impala, and we haven't had the ORC. One of the things we want to go back and look at is what does it look like over ORC, especially now that Spark can actually support it, so we can actually do the comparison together with, with the same engine. Right. Does Parquet support the ranges, Richard? Oh, you probably didn't hear the question. I, afterwards, when you come and you can talk to one of my senior principal guys and he can explain it. Probably better than I can. Right. Exactly. That's one of the things that we've always said to Cloudera is can you support ORC? And it'd be interesting if they do. Right, so thank you. Um, as I said, we actually have some of the code. It will be up on our GitHub page. So some of the, the queries I went through are actually up there and some of the code to create the, the data sets. And I, like everyone else says, we are hiring. So we'll be down here at the front. Thank you. <laughs>